Great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Shrago. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think there must be a lot of people joined the Zoom. I'm sorry who's joined the Zoom right now, so I can't see who they are, but very, it's my great honor to be here. And again, at Stanford, uh, I, I left here 2014, um, and currently, I thought I'm going to stay a f maybe a few years in Birmingham, but <laughs> I'm still there. So <laughs> it's a nice place. And if you have any chance to visit South, uh, just please let me know. Um, and uh, it's my great honor to be here. I'm currently associate professor at the UAB and also working at the VA. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my current interest about the industry integrity. Um, it's my great honor to see everybody here in person and also in the Zoom. Sorry, I can't communicate well with the people in the Zoom. Here's my disclosures. And let's start with some quiz. This is like published 20, uh, 2008. This is kind of busy slides. But can you see anything wrong here? So let's maybe help you. Let's look at just figure A here, right here, enlargement. Did you now see any difference here? <laughs> Dr. Stone was here, but you know, I don't do a lot of the gel analysis, but like, uh, but you see that this gels, this panel and this panel is identical, right? And next one, this panels and this panels also identical. Interesting thing is that you can see the purple rectangular. This has to be a different study and different line. But you see that the contrast has been changed. This is a little bit lighter, and you see that this is a little darker, right? <coughs> Let's go to the next one. What about this one? This is a little busy slide. You probably can see it. Let's zoom it. Just figure A right here. Well, I don't see any difference, right? There's nothing wrong with this one. This is very subtle. You have to really open your eyes really well. I changed the contrast. Look at all this here, right here. In the PowerPoint, you can change your contrast. What did you see now? These images actually coming from this one. They're all identical samples but they crop differently and put in different samples. So basically what they, they wanted to test this kind of like integrity of their controls and see this factor only acted with this and this one only acted with this. So the rest of them, there's no reaction, but they don't think they do any really good gel study. So they're actually, they're just same identical pictures. So all these, the one I show you, the two figures are from him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, testing. It, the, that's his study. He's currently scrutinizing EMSO and also these papers. So that's currently what they're working on right now and see what's going on. I was really shocked about the second one because you don't look good, but you have to put your Photoshop and change the contrast. You can't see the difference. And can you spot a duplication here? This is like nasal polyp. This said control, anterocoronal polyp, non-eosinophic nasal polyp, eosinophic nasal polyp. Look at this one right here. They're identical figures, but they changed the ratio. And the um, it came out 2021. It's not from any time five, ten years ago. They change the different size and they change the positioning and then also change the little bit of a contrast. So, um, so I'm not really interested in this until <laughs> the reason I'm interested in this site. Like, since 2021, 2022, I've reviewed multiple journals, including Korea and here US, IFAR. I'm currently be the associate editor of IFAR, uh, the Rhinology Journal. By looking at multiple journals, they usually send me all this basic science paper from a lot of times from Asia and also from the U.S. But when I look at all these images, one day I was looking at it, oh my God, there are like 16 duplication in one image, one figures. And then I look at, this is a time that in our university, my chair asked me to participate to the responsible of the research committee. So I did some training and that I learned about Elizabeth Bick, she's from the Stanford. And then people really manipulate images and like, there's no way. And then since then, I'm looking at all these journals reviewing in the ENT journals, I've seen multiples. But there's a type of duplicate images because we are the humans, we could make a mistake. 
it could be three categories. You can just do the simple duplications, or you can do duplication with repositioning or the alterations. So for example, like this is the number two and three pushing alteration. This is considered as kind of like fraud. Simple duplication, you, if you upload multiple figures when you do a lot of like immunofluorescent, you could actually make some mistakes. For example, simple duplications like this, like this one. Actually, this boat like, is sank in Hong Kong, so there's no you know, jumbo boat restaurant. I heard that this is no longer exists in Hong Kong. <laughs> it sank when they're transport. So but, <laughs> but this is the picture that exactly, this is the figure one, figure four, this duplication. And we're about to okay, repositioning is like this one. So you actually, you change the same figure, but actually positioning the location of where you're going to capture it. So, and the third one is like duplication alterations. For example, you change the contrast. So you actually think that there's a difference. And they actually put another image right next to it, which was doesn't exist. And this kind of thing is the alteration of the images. So um, this is advanced level. <laughs> I reviewed this paper in I4 and I found multiple, maybe like six, five or six, seven duplications, so we rejected it. And six months later, this was published in the Frontiers, right here. It's still published. And this is very advanced level. So when you go close by, what do you think different? So all these things are different treatments. Staph warriors, some of the 90%, the staph warriors, staph are a di different concentration. <coughs> And this is something different bacteria there. And then you, you see here, this one and this one, and this one and this one, these are the identical samples. You see this is very crisp and this is very blurry. Why they make so blurry? And this one, the same thing. This is a little bit like higher, higher images, but this is actually different. But they're actually from the identical samples. So, um, so, so they actually repositioning and alteration of all these figures. So I learned first as a 2005. Dr. Hwang Lusak is one of the national hero when I was growing up in South Korea because he actually did the, he actually cloned a lot of animals at that time. You're gonna make a human like stem cells for research. He was national national like hero, and one day he got a news that he fabricated all his images. So like so. But he also, I think that he still, still recognizes actually he, uh, he is able to duplicate the, the dog. But he actually has duplicated a lot of the fabrication, a lot of stem cells there. So like major, major thing is he all, a lot of his science papers are actually they're the same images but it's cropped very differently. So that was learned in 2005 and I'm looking at this like really this is happening in 2021? So that was kind of things that I was really, really shocked. And then so someone is really good at it's North Korean missile, for example, there are a lot of people doing it, not only for scientists, they actually change the missiles and contracts and everything. So the people do the same things on the other world. But, um, sorry, when you talk about, I don't know why, one second, let me change the slideshow. Huh, I maybe took this one, okay. So, um, there's a federal office about the responsible research called the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and um, they actually talk about three things. One is the uh, fabrication and falsification and plagiarism. So fabrication is you actually make your own, you make your own data, the make up all the results. And falsification is the manipulating research materials, equipment, and processing or changing or omitting the data results. So. Um, this is a picture of my dad. He's a PhD, uh, and he's now retired, of course. And he did the PhD in um, in Japan in 1970s. Uh, so he really struggled in Japan because living for South Koreans, living in Japan at that point, it was not really that easy. But he his mentor, like his you know mentor, was really uh, really helped him a lot. He got a PhD. His mentor one day told him that the guy right next to him, my dad's friend, he always asked the mentor what's the hypothesis of this your experiment? And then he knows the hypothesis and he make a perfect data always. But if you tell, if you don't tell the hypothesis and they don't, he can't make any of the experiments. So now I have a postdoc in my office. I don't tell him what to, I ask him to do something, but I don't tell him what the hypothesis is. 
you have to figure out to tell me on data. Because if you tell them like what you have to make it, sometimes they really make up a lot of data. But it's really true. So I try to like, when I'm working with even the residents, and uh, what's, what do you want to expect from this result, this study? I don't know, you just figure out. I don't know what should I do. You know, you have to figure out what's going on there. But you can read about it if you want to figure out what the hypothesis is. But I really don't give them what has to be in, in that result. So, um, and the last one is the plagiarism. It's like you actually manipulate, uh, you know, copying someone else's ideas without giving a profit credits. So uh, these are the three things that we actually take a look at about the research misconduct. And this actually does not include someone, we, we all human, you make a, like, you know, human honest errors or different opinions, this really doesn't really matter. So this is very different. So there is like Office of Research, uh, Office of Research Integrity. This is uh, one of the federal government. I went to this website this morning and actually there's like three people are actually listed almost one PhD every U.S. institution who makes a fraud and they have been fired from these institutions like MD, PhD, PhDs, PhDs, all like from the uh, Purdue University. It's one of prestigious universities. So they actually do this, this kind of investigation ongoing. I'm also part of the, our team. We're also at UAB, so we are also, I'm also part of the committee. We are working on um, uh, PIs, some of the PIs of the investigating their frauds. So we actually has to be non-conflict of interest and everything has to be, has to be very transparent. But one of this person that actually December 13th, so this is from the Purdue that are actually, she actually make a fake data of the 400 images in, in her NIH 16 grant applications. So, so what I'm saying is this is not only happening in other countries, also happening in our, in, in our, in our fossil here in the U.S. So um, when you go to Office of Research Integrity, um, there's multiple ways you can detect this. And then one of the things that you can find is called the uh, droplet programs. And then, but I'm never using it, but it's one of the things that you have to combine your Photoshop and you actually put two images and see which one is duplicated. So it's called the droplet images. But another one person is, I just wanted to talk to you. This is, she used to be working a researcher at one of the lab, microbiology lab at Stanford. Elizabeth Bick, and she's currently working freelancer, science, uh, science integrity officer. She detects a lot of frauds, and she actually, there are multiple, well, there are multiple like, you know, articles about her. It's like, really interesting read. So I, during my training at UAB Become a Research, uh, one of the committee, I re that was the first time I actually ever learned about her, and then I'll keep on working with her and learning about her. She also had Twitter, and she actually give a quiz on Twitter every day that can you find the duplicate images in this images? So I go over her like Twitters every day and try to learn my <laughs> eyes every day and try to figure out what is a duplicate images. And then she actually posts like this image forensics and, try to, and then I go there and try to figure out what's the images. So this is kind of like you're training your eyes, like, you know, like a magic eye kind of system so you can learn it. Another option is we have AI system. Uh, it's called Image Twin. Uh, this is not really a commercially available program. I was able to contact, through the Elizabeth Stick, I was able to contact them and now have an access to use this uh, program. So when I go over any of my uh, reviews, I firstly go into this website and put in my app manuscript there. And then first of all, screening is there any possible duplications. And then I just start my review. If I start to say something, I just, you know, tell them to reject it. There's no point of reviewing, send the reviewers. So this is very interesting. So when I first figure out this one, there's something wrong. I can I was looking for three hours on Friday afternoon. <laughs> I have to go home. I stay in my desk till 8 p.m. in my office, like looking at this image, it's, what's wrong with there? Something is wrong. And then I send the Twitter, I didn't know, I Twitter to Elizabeth, Elizabeth, can you notice any duplication? And she immediately responded. She's from Holland and she said, yes. There's a duplication. So image twin find is. That's why she actually let me know about where the duplication is. So, um, so what I did, so that's why, so once I get this program, I get a, this is unpublished, I'm gonna present it because of this year, but, so I searched rhinology papers, how many been duplicated? That's my hypothesis, so it's October 22, I just put the immunofluorescence in sinonasal and I searched it. 
and I actually ran this program to see how many immunofluorescent images have been duplicated. And there were 69 articles I total they found. Image between flag 20, about 30%, they said it's duplicated. But because of Western blood, gel blood, I'm not 100% sure whether they said similar, but I can't 100% sure. I exclude some things I can't 100% sure. But of those 20 articles, 10 articles are found to be definite duplicate images, about 15%. And those are 15%, uh, the 10 articles, the, most of them are most of them are usually category three, which means they altered all the images. It's not even like duplication. There's only one duplications, uh, but simple like error, but rest of them are all like, nine of them are likely related to the like on purpose duplication. And there's, I don't see any, or, uh, any institutions coming from the US, uh, mostly from China, and also there are a few Korea, and there are a few Australia. So, um, so, and then I was talking about this article with my other colleagues, and they said, someone's gonna, <laughs> I'm just, we have to worry about re re retaliation or something, someone's gonna attack me afterwards. So, <laughs> because I'm just, I've become like really, uh, you know, after publishing these articles. But it's kind of really, I was kind of shocked, well, this is like already published articles. But there's another way of you can figure out, it's called the pub peers. Pub peers is pubpeer.com. You can go in and register as a public website. This is a kind of like post-publication peer review. If you feel like there's something is wrong, you can only write down sent to the corresponding authors. So it's like, uh, it can be controversial, but actually you go in there and then you can figure out what's, what's wrong, like something is, it's any flag or anything. For example, if you put his name here, <laughs> And then you can figure out there are 17 results. There are 17 articles that have been flagged. But currently five of them are currently in active investigations right now. So, uh, so actually if you go to PUP here, you can put your name. I, I want to put my name, make sure that I don't make any mistake. <laughs> and then, um, so, but actually they go over everything and trying to figure out is there any questions. But it's not really someone trying to punish or anything. So this is very, uh, for example, this is one of the jackets paper, but someone mentioned that there's some like duplications here, but turn out to be this. And then you know, this guy, you can write it about it. If you if you're a reviewer, if you're the author, you can write about. Oh, this is like an honest mistake. One day, changing the figures from the publishing company, they actually make a duplication. So it's kind of like kind of like you can just back and forth. You can you can always talk about honestly about it. It's not something you're trying to. Like criticize or trying to give you any punitive damage or anything about it, it's trying to give you some feedbacks, and you can also always respond it. So this kind of thing is about pup here. If you have any something that you know interesting, but um, but another thing is about uh, this article. It's coming from the uh, Stanford President. It is currently currently in the research, but Ian. so. They already flagged this one in Pup Peers 2000, 2018. It's about like four years ago. But their response is, but they're responding now, like December, when they, everything started. So which means they still have time for four years to address this, but why they even didn't do anything and it's like four years later they actually want to address it. Because people already notice and say something about this for 2018, but they haven't done anything, and then now they're working on it. So that's another question that I wanted to raise it, like why, why, it's, why it's now, like if, was it supposed to be? If I'm the author, if I'm the author, if one of the corresponding authors, or one of the senior authors, there's something wrong, I will just go and just change immediately. I don't want to be sit there so I don't even notice it, right? I don't know what you think, but that's what I'm gonna do, right? So there's some papers, the correlation is that relate to the impact factors of like, you know, Hindali or whatever, open access really. I mean, there are some correlation, inverted correlations that like higher impact or they really have less uh, of image duplication, but it's, it doesn't mean that there's no, but there's still image duplication even in the 40s and 50s impact factors. But, but still there's more higher when they're actually going into the lower impact factors, of course. Yeah. Um, 
But another thing is the responses from journals. So when you see this, so, um, so one other person is kind of like a feed fight. It's kind of like bar fight. <laughs> so when you send something to the journals, so ask them to correct it. It's a rather than like, oh, like it's not an order investigation. The process can be very messy, which means that between angry whistleblowers and you know the the authors and also a lot of red tape, lack of communications. Hi, Dr. Alakia. <laughs> and like there's there's a lot of things going on. So for me, um, I send the uh, I send the email to the correspondent the editor of the journals about those two journals that I figure out which is really really disappointing but I haven't heard from them yet that was in December of last year so for example their responsive journals responsive is too slow and it's like a very too little and it's too late so for example when I go to frontier microbiologist and report something and there's a lot of editors and their email's not there, actually. There's no contact information. So what I have to go is figure out their name, put it in the pop man, and figure out their senior authorship, one of the papers, find their email numbers. So it's, it's very difficult to find who's a senior author. It's like trying to report this. So, but once they responded, they respond my email, oh, we noticed it, this is really true issue, and we're gonna address it. But since then, I, we, I, have never, I haven't heard anything from that yet. So um, this is one of the talk from the Elizabeth Speak that when she um, when she talk about it, it takes about the six years that one of the the articles like you know that actually responded. So other retractions or retracted expressed concern, but no actions. But you can see that surprisingly, like Hindawi Journal, they actually responded. But a lot of times, a lot of like company publishing company, they a lot of times they actually no actions even after six years. So every journal sector, their response is very different. How they they don't have it probably don't have a really rigid format to go over all these kind of issues. Hey boss, I got a cool. Are you okay? Yes, Christopher. Why do you ask? Um, you're ripping out pages of a journal. Yeah, because it's worthless, Christopher. Okay, what's going on? The government has decided that we can't make people pay for research that was funded by the government. That's a bad thing? Yes, the entire academic publishing business model is making taxpayers pay for things they've already paid for. But that's so unnecessary. That there's no reason for that business model to exist. Of course it's unnecessary. Look, you don't get on the cover of Middleman Monthly by being necessary. What are my fellow middlemen going to say when they hear I've been cut out? I don't know. That's the number one rule of being a middleman. You don't get cut out. I'm so sorry. I don't think you mean that. No. No, I don't. We've been gatekeeping academic research for far too long. Things need to change. Oh, don't be dramatic. We don't gatekeep research. Yes, we do. You even named the company softball team the gatekeepers. Well, if we can't profit off of publicly funded research, how are us lowly publishers supposed to make ends meet, Christopher? We make billions of dollars every year. I think we'll be okay. Yeah, for now. Within five years, our profit margins could go as low as Google. You know, this is a good thing for society. It gives the public more access to the latest scientific advancements. Well, I hope the public enjoys their free randomized control trials because I am about to create open access fees that are so egregious. It'll make United Healthcare blush. So, um, so this, all these publishing companies make so much money, now you have to pay for it. Now the open access, when I submit all the grants, now I actually put my budget, the publication fees. So even though now because of the government doesn't allow to, NIH funded research cannot be uh, you, you have to be, there's no embargo, you have to immediately publish. But now we have to pay for these publications. But actually their response to quality control is so slow to the point that it's like sometimes it's very ridiculous, unexpected. So my next, uh, so why do you think there's a lot of many scientists commit this time mis research misconduct? So there's one survey came out from plus one. 
So there are some as are researchers that have you ever personally ever committed scientific fraud? There's only about 1.72%. Have you seen anybody, your friend did a crime? This is like 14%. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so then why do we care about this? This is my, um, it's a foundation of science. It's a one block by block. So if you build a block, which means that you find a one foundation and go to the next level based on that research paper. So, and then at the same time, um, it's the public confidence of researchers and research evidence. So it's like during the COVID-19, we actually experienced a lot of false data about chloroquine and everything. And then also underpinning continued federal investment in research and then protecting the reputation in your career and preventing adverse impact on the patients and the public and also promoting, promoting our economic advancements and also preventing a board, like, you know, avoid a waste of resource. We don't have to do another study for doing that, duplicate a research. Already someone did over why we have to repeat it. So that's why we actually really trust on this. Then, then why people are still doing this? I think because we're living out the world of outcome of productivity, right? So you have to produce multiple papers, you have to submit somewhere. And then also there are some like conflict interests involved if you do like drug company sponsored studies or relate to fundings. And at the same time, the career promotion pressures, for example, like medical students. So I was interviewing this year and my job usually in my institution is review their research. I usually go over their publication and the ERS application forms. I really go to the, and then they put their names on it in the PubMed. The reason is, I'm trying not to criticize someone, they may be updated publication they missed after they submitted. There's one student, it was a mismatch. So, and they're looking at their published article and I type it, there's, that was not in his article. I realized he put his name <laughs> in one of the articles that he never published. But he doesn't really have to. He already have like 10 publications. He had an extra year to research somewhere, prestigious institution, you know? And then he put his name, but I asked my resident, can you, like, is there something they changed in your application? You have the PubMed ID automatically goes in your application? No, you have to type in every individual articles. Which means that his name was not there in the PubMed, he put his name there. So I ask him, <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, there might be some um, there might be some confusion about this. Can you explain this? He said, first he said, I made a, that was my fault that I you know, it was true. Then I keep on asking, him, I can see it, and he said, oh, they're trying to put his name right now because they miss his name. But you can't put your name there because your name is not there in the PubMed. So um, I think people have a lot of pressures because promotion and career, applying to residency and getting to the program. So, um, and all the funding pressures. If you need to get funding, you have to publish, you know, better papers, and also your pressure, like postdocs or, you know, research tax. And also, like, uh, some people, I mean, you know, probably most people are not in fact, you have probably negative findings. Um, so that's probably they all wanted to publish with positive findings. I'd rather just to change the methodology and trying to do experiment in a different way instead of, so that's another reason that probably that's what we're having we have to some people really produce all these data. Of course, there's some gray areas. For example, like up to like 33.7%, there's questionable practice. For example, like if you, for example, if you do the company sponsor research like here, a lot of times the first draft were written by pharmaceutical company research associates, right? And then sometimes we conceal some of the relevant findings, but data looks great what we have submitted, right? And sometimes we actually withhold some details of methodology. Sometimes you do the in uh, p values. Oh, there's outlier. Can we just get rid of it, you know? So, you know, so there are also a lot of things, you know, temptations that it's not really 100% it's fabrication, but they're always something the gray area that we also have uh, every day. Even the medical students, our researchers, residents, everybody, oh, I have to submit this for abstract causum or AAO this year, and they're like, oh, can I look at this data? But, you know, we have a lot of pressures every day. 
Uh, I want to talk about dual publications overlooking some questionable interpretation data. So double dipping. Dual publication is double dipping. You actually submit identical contents in this and then go to submit somewhere else. For example, it is so published in Rhinology. Biofilm formation, staph caucus, and pseudomonas, chronic sinusitis, 2006, head and neck. Another picture, a a AJRA, same thing. Same authors, but different name. When I go to the abstract, the first one, 20, 22 of 31 samples. And same thing, 22 of 31 samples. Same identical data, but two different publications. But it's very intentional because they changed the, uh, they changed the titles and everything. Look at the figures, identical, but they change the contrast, it's a little darker. So we don't, but recently, uh, I haven't seen this one uh, right now, but if I were this author, I would just reject it right now. But like, it's still there, no one's saying anything. Maybe our society, ENT, is very lenient to each other that we're really trying to not to be that person. <laughs> but it's kind of elephant in the room, but no one want to talk about it. You know, someone may say that, that maybe not me kind of attitudes. Uh, plagiarism is a huge thing in South Korea because the first lady's uh, like PhD dissertation is like the plagiarism, uh, copy somebody's ideas. Uh, that was been last year. So, um, but at the same time, the another issue is about the, uh, about 2017 or I reviewed the IFAR as a reviewer and I told David Kennedy that I found the exactly same article, which was published somewhere else already, and but authors are totally different. <laughs> How could this happen? So that's the paper mail. Which means that like some company, they sell their study to this author, is that author, who doesn't have really time for the research. It doesn't happen anymore here, it's more in Asia. But they actually, they, you have to just pay 5000 or 10000 and then they, add to the re they said they do the research for you and they write a paper. But it's like profit-oriented, unofficial, potential legal organization produce these type of papers. They're written by ghostwriters and based on the templates. So they actually publish the same thing, data, but data looks amazing. But they also make by the company. They're once, same data, but one is pancreatic cancer, one is stomach cancer, one is a brain cancer and multiple authors on it. So one of the things like you see that, this is two identical data but different authorship. This is one of the things, the example of paper mill, it was the, it was the microRNA 605-3P inhibits melanin progression of prostate cancer while relating um, this one. As part of urology, I don't know why neurosurgery is there. If an ENT was there, one of the authors, can you tell me what's wrong with this table? I was surprised that even the reviewer, they even accepted it as in an impact factor of 3.5 and they retracted afterwards. Can you see the difference? There are females listed in the paper and the, this is prostate cancer. Yes, exactly. <laughs> female. In China, 27 female there. It's more, it's more male. <laughs> for for us, say the answer. But this is already published. I mean, how could it even possible, right? This is one of the paper mills. It was just published. So uh, I thought it initially it was okay, but it's not. I thought it was not okay, but it's okay that it may be acceptable. For example, if you wrote something in like Chinese and Korean, and if you wanted to publish in English journal, they don't consider it as dual publication. As long as you disclose everything, both editors, and uh, you actually have a different audience, you have a different purposes. So actually that's not really dual publication, that's acceptable. So if you someone publish a similar thing in the other language and you publish in English, that's fine. But that's not really a problem. So I'm also looking at the overlooking at the question of interpreter. This is my research. I do, uh, I re because I are also interested about what's the human normal microbiome is when you first started. We talk about a lot of discussions. And the people do 16S RNA, I did when I was here in uh, when resident, we did the Peter about 16S RNA about the, the papers about human microbiomes. But 16S RNA sequencing is so sensitive. 
it's so sensitive that you can detect everything. It's like if you put the garbage in, you're going to pick garbage out, which means you have to really good data. So, for example, there's an E. coli, and you culture it, and you plated it, and you do 16S, you can see these samples. Then, when you put autoclave, you have the heat kill all the E. coli, and you repeat the same studies, you did the 16S, you got the same identical data. Which means 16S RNA also like detect the kill the bacteria and data. And the, um, so this is actually, so detecting bacteria of 16S doesn't mean that it's actually present. It's just, it doesn't mean that it's like resin the microbiome. It's not really live there. It can be a dead bacteria. Anything can be possible. So, uh, and then also interpreting the microbiome data is proportional. It's not like a lot of people's y-axis consider the n number is like absolute value, but it's not. It's a relative abundance, which means, for example, there's a total bacteria of A and B, and there's a different one, two, three samples. For example, let's do it two F3. So when you do the 16S RNA, it shows like this, which means that when you are actually the total bacteria, you don't see the total bacteria. You actually the proportion of bacteria. So actually, if you don't have a lot of bacteria there, and then you do like very clean samples and doing the this kind of assay, then you will not see able to see anything. So it's like, it's not really mean anything. So, but a lot of people think that this is 16S RNA is a total bacteria, but it's not. So another thing is that my research initially was what is a distinct, what is a healthy human microbiome? Because there are a lot of people transport a lot of stuff in their nose about the sinus microbiome, rinses and everything. Even they now have a kimchi sinus cure. They put like kimchi. One of the papers showed the lactobacilli can improve the sinus disease because of the human, healthy human actually has lactobacillus, just like, just like a kimchi. So actually, when you look at this, uh, the, this site, you actually put the, dip your finger in your kimchi so and put it in your nose. That actually, that actually, uh, that actually improve your sinus disease. Now there's multiple companies make a sinus, you know, pro bacteria for your sinus disease. Number one, it doesn't really make sense. The reason is, pro bacteria. This is the lactobacillus. They usually don't go in anaerobic condition. They usually go in anaerobic condition where they're in oxygen. But sinus cavity is totally oxygenated, so which means this bacteria, even you put it in, it's not going to grow. It's not going to do anything. That was my thought process. And then, uh, so when I did the human, I, so what I did, I take the patient to the operating room, and I collect the OR saline, sterile saline in the OR table, and then I also did the one sample, I just did the human sinus middle meatus. And, and this is what I got. And this is all like, all looks very similar. You know what these green bars are? These are the salines. Which means that if the human, healthy human microbiome, they cannot tell between the saline in your ore table and healthy because there are so less bacteria there. The only thing they detect is the water, all the master mix, RNA later, what you put it in. Those are the detected in 16S RNA. That was my finding. So I don't see any difference. And the, this is a lactobacillus. That lactobacillus was found in all the saline samples also. So, so, so I submitted R21 last year and I, I got the lowest score ever in my life. <laughs> Reviewer hated it, hated it, hated it. This is already been done while you're doing this. This is already been established while you're doing this. <laughs> so, and then I did the PCOI plot. The saline and the healthy human patients, like they're really similar. But in the, there is not much of a characteristic there. They're a little bit different than some other patients, but there are a lot of overlapping. So what people found was from the lactobacillus and healthy, they, maybe it's not from the humans, maybe from the somewhere else. And so this is not only from the sinuses, it's only from lung, same thing. If the CF kits doesn't have infections, and actually they are also 16S are coming from bacteria contaminations. And also the, even the eye, uh, National Institute of Eye Institution, NIH, also interested about the microbiome in the very sterile condition, like uh, in ocular spaces. But my understanding is that like, identifying a healthy microbiome is extremely challenging and also need like caution when you interpret these data. But whenever I try so much like reviewing this thing, they really don't want to take care of it because they probably, because someone already published in the very in the highest level in the research, they already published something else, it's going to contradict their own original 
thought process. So then what can we done here? So I wrote this small article in ENT Today last year. There's no, no, one, there's no one magic bullet. Uh, we should adopt a multi faceted approach, focus on the prevention, awareness, and also education. And for example, in journal editors, we need to have a very fair unbiased reviews. They need to have some very good quality controls and they have a strict standards of accurate, robust, and transparent description of the methods and outcomes. For example, all these data is now have to, you have to upload into the uh, cloud, the public cloud that everybody can have an access. For example, like 16S RNA, you have to upload into the NIH website. Institution, you also have to be educational awareness of critical elements in the research design analysis. And research also, researcher, you also have to have a lot of training and also like good data management, which could be findable, accessible, and reusable. Uh, that's probably one of the things NIH really focus on. And publisher also have to be, have more pre-screeners and good quality controls and also strategy for recruiting quality reviewers to work at the better journals published. Because all the studies found on those researches. So study like January starting 2023, NIH require you have the two pages about how you're gonna do the data management sharing plans. I think it's gonna go to the, all the other uh, the journals right later on where we publish any data, which means that you have to plan how you're gonna share your data later on. For example, images, how are you gonna share it? So this is the one this morning, the Elizabeth Twitter. So there's a one paper that was flagged and he showed his picture of his lab note. <laughs> this is the original <laughs> raw data. So, uh, but you can't show your lab book for your raw, raw data. So, uh, but now NIH wanted to do like something like this. For example, if you had images, you have to get only a raw images and TI files and you have to go somewhere else like this is an example, bioimage archives or something that you have to upload all these images as a, uh, as a meta, uh, meta, uh, metadata. So, so we're currently in our institute using bioimage archive. This is from the UK. We have to register account. We have to upload all the images it was done by NIH. So everybody can have an access to all the images and raw data, get an access to it. It's really hard. It's not really that easy because of now, another reason is this, the, these images are all different, but the images are created by AI. Even the AI now can make a fake images. And the question is now AI can detect it, but AI can also create a fake images. So this is something that I just wanted to focus on. Like, you know, the future could be, it cannot be really too bright. <laughs> So uh, this is my last slide. So a false statement of a fact made deliberately is the most serious crime a scientist can commit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good, though. Thank you. Yes. Any questions? <laughs> I have a challenge for you, Doe. Yes. Welcome back, first of all, to Stanford. It's great to hear your talk. I really enjoyed it. This is Rob. I know you might not be seeing the video. Um, no, the I, can, I can see you right now. Yes. Beautiful so house in the background. Even, even worse. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let, let me ask you, and then I'll share with you my thought, and I'm curious your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, a distinguished president of this university who's in a situation in which there's some serious questions about the academic integrity of a number of his publications. And um, my question for you is, do you think that um, the university should allow him to continue currently in his position, given what you've shown and what I've seen before, I recognize those, you know, the evidence that there were some serious problems. And of course, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it may be, I think you raised the point uh, that's valid, I'll contextualize it this way, that, you know, many of the graduate students working with then the uh, president of Rockefeller, right, are high flyers, they're spending two, three, four years on a project, if it's coming out negative, that's not going to get them the premier job. So there's a tremendous emphasis on getting high impact findings. And so, uh, you know, perhaps that's part of the problem. We create such a high pressure thing and we devalue negative findings that in well constructed research. And so, you know, then of course you have the laboratory head who has many other duties, but who nevertheless has an absolute and solemn requirement 
to sign off and accept responsibility for the publication on which he, uh, she or his name is on. So uh, I ask you, I, I know that there's an investigation ongoing, but given the high ethical requirements of being such an academic leader, should he be in the position he is in now with the questions that have been raised? What's your thoughts, though? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, so my thought process is that, because I'm part of the review committee, so in that case, uh, it's still very controversial, but I would say hold his position as a leader. It doesn't mean that he has to resign, but someone actually work as an interim until this is finalized, and that he can come back once they actually find a verdict, and he can come back as the president again. I think that will be make a very fair and when a third person watches it, sees it, that will be, well, you know, uh, that will be a no issues. But if it's become an acting president still, and then someone's like working on his stuff, that can be, that also give it a little like uh, less burden for those committee who are actually working on. So I think that could be more fair. That's, I agree, there's a lot of pressure. But, but beyond, when I'm working in the lab, when I go all the data or the researchers, because I know that person for a long period of time, I know that this is not good or not. I kind of feel, but my, my, another frustration about his cases are that the, why he hasn't addressed earlier, why he has it addressed now, it was supposed to be addressed earlier because everybody already raised questions. But he said that there's some of the papers that a science, I think that was cells and science paper, he said that he submitted something that he's, there's some worries about the images, but they said the journal was, neglected it or they decided not to put it on but that was 2011 thing but that also going to be go over from review committee but if i were the uh if i were the authors of one of those papers then i would say i would, should have addressed earlier that should, this should not have been happened so that's that's my thought process yes so, so i i agree with you I, I think that it would make sense for him to step aside as the um, investigation goes forward. I mean, after all, you know, every undergraduate who has committed plagiarism or used, you know, a chat bot to produce a paper, um, uh, you know, they're held to a higher standard. Faculty are held to a high standard. I think that the senior leaders have to be held to the absolutely highest standard. Now, unfortunately, it's not a defense to say that, you know, I wasn't there making the blots, you know, um, but, you know, uh, you in the end of the day are the captain of the ship. So I could see him stepping aside. I have difficulty seeing an outcome that brings him back. Uh, although, you know, right. it remains to be seen, is there a possible, it it's just requires such a high standard of integrity to lead an institution like Stanford. And if you begin to make excuses of, lack of oversight and lack of adequate participation uh, on the part of any faculty member, uh, that's a problem. It, it breaks that uh, covenant that we have about this solemnness. And now all of us pay very close attention to what's being written and that what our name is on, particularly our name is on a senior scientist. One of my concerns is that he did disclose, I agree with you, sell. But he did he share that with the search committee when he was under consideration at Stanford? That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. So it's it just shows, and I've got to tell you, my, my overall gestalt is I think that he is uh, first and foremost a superb scientist, that his reputation as an innovative and excellent scientist is right, and I think he probably has perfect integrity. I don't think he knew any of this was happening. I think he's a victim of it. It's a bit like David Baltimore some years ago, a very similar situation. But nevertheless, it's one of those situations, and I'd love to hear other opinions. I think the captain of the ship in a situation like this has to accept responsibility. It is even in Stanford's own academic handbook that you cannot claim that you had no knowledge, something in which you are an author, let alone the principal investigator and senior author. That is not a defense. It's written in our own um, academic handbook. Any other thoughts, though, Younger? I'm curious because it hits so close to home, you know, how others feel. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I was surprised it's happening almost every day. Today I just saw the news from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. They also mm -hmm. take down one of the PhDs for fraud. And then I was recently I gave a grand rounds in the Duke, and there's one of the clinical trial person sponsored by NIH where to be all the clinical data is fabricated. So, which means that it's like now it's like 
there's multiple sources are coming out, almost the huge things coming out once every week to the point that it's not become really too surprised right now. Yes. Zara, to you. you follow yeah. Retraction Watch. I get an email from Retraction yeah. Watch every day, <laughs> exactly. and I find it very interesting. I've been following it for years. Uh, yeah, uh, having been an editor for over a decade, uh, these kinds of things, uh, you know, it's much, you mentioned about, you know, republishing the same work. But what I saw much more common was salami slicing right, right. Uh, a particular body of work into the minimal publishable unit, if you will. <laughs> Comes out in, you know, little pieces in three journals. Right, exactly. Without, and without necessarily having self-citation. Yeah. Right. Sarah, do you have... Hey, hey Joe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry, Joe. This is this is Lisa Orloff. Um, that was really terrific. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. And um, I know we're short on time, but can, can you just comment very briefly on the predatory journals that are soliciting research? Um, I'm sure we all get daily yes. several, you know, invitations. Right. And and also as a side note. Um, the I, I maybe I missed the point of the video, which was funny, but I'm gonna go have to have to look at it again. Um, the the cost to publish that some of these open access journals right, right. require sometimes in like legitimate research that you are sometimes invited to submit or you submit and then right. you find out that there's a three or four or five thousand dollar publishing cost. So if you could talk about that, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Like so. Um, well, as long as there's a good peer reviews, uh, I really don't find where you're publishing, but the question is about the open access. Like there are several journals, like uh, some of the things I'm not going to say in public, but there's some journals that which not in the uh, PubMed IDs, but also asking a lot of monies. Uh, but those are the kind of questions that we have to really publish. Another question is this, I recently reviewed the residence uh, application, the one medical students all published curious <laughs> or case report. Can we consider that as a research? But it was a lot of competition. So writing a one publication is very difficult. And uh, submitting it, uh, uploaded as a medical student, how, how we should be, how can we judge that whether it's a good, a good or bad? So I really, yeah, I got a multiple emails every day, uh, multiple conferences. When you go to Wikipedia, there's sites that you should be very careful. These kind of conferences, journals, everything. But yeah, I agree. It, it, it's a very difficult answer. But I would say that as long as there's a good peer review and there's a good publication, I'm still okay with it. Uh, but at the same time, I really it doesn't really make sense to publish more than like uh, maybe more than thousand dollars or something to publish any of the papers because they're already sponsored by those government fundings and also institutions. So um, yes, uh, I, I hope they answer question. That's a really difficult. I agree. We're all struggling, but ethically, about which one is the best. Yes. Yeah. So that that brings me to my question um, really nicely, which is the peer review process. And and because we're both on IFAR board, you know that um, the idea of how blinded our reviews are is a topic that I keep trying to bring up. And you know, do you think? in this world where, of course, there is pressure to publish, and there's also pressure, we know, in like the medical environment, not just within institutions, but within our organizations, our national organizations, that you feel respect and sort of obligation to people that you respect, that there may be, when the review is not a double-blinded review process, right. that may be playing into why people don't necessarily pick up on what should be an obvious image duplication or even if they suspect something, right, right. don't have your courage right. to go and say, hey, this is someone that is you know, publishing something right, that right. they shouldn't be. And so can you speak to like how you think our blinding or non-double non blinding may be playing into that? I, th I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> but like um, we had a debate about IFAR recent editorial meetings right, about it. Uh, I understand the both sides. One side is that because NIH, they're looking at the institution, we never blind NIH when you grant submission. We never blind institution. We know who your PI. For example, if you have a KO8, you're looking at the mentors, who your mentors are. But would it be legitimate without putting all those things? But at the same time, when I'm reviewing the journals, it's something from very prestigious institution and present rhinology <laughs> or present, past present, and then they publish something as a corresponding author. That's a very difficult to reject. Be honest with you, yeah. my personal opinion. 
So, I completely agree. And yeah. We also know that yeah. just looking at the names of authors, right, right. Um, if they're not, um, if, if it happens to be a female name or right, happens right. to be a name right. that looks like an underrepresented minority, there's an immediate bias that goes into how you perceive that paper. Right. But yeah, but, but that's, but I, for me, for personally, I don't really look at the, their names, whether females or, but by looking at more of a, the institutions and their, how many they published before, what the track record, they have published good papers. That's why I'm looking at those authors and uh, see what they are. But I agree with you. So, but do, do you know, the double blinding is not that easy. I published one of the papers, a double blinding. What they say, you don't have to submit the first page, that front sheet. You review start the abstract. And then they just mark the all the institution. That's it. So double blinding is not really there because you have to change your, uh, you know, the you know instruction of you how you upload your manuscript because you just don't submit the first page, not into the manuscript. Then that, that become double blind. You don't see. Just start with the abstract. Exactly. Right. So it's not that difficult. But some journals they do that you don't really cost a lot of money for doing that. But but uh, I'm also one of the diverse community. You know. But. But I'm, I don't really look at their names. Or, I mean, you can tell whether they're African Americans or you know minority. We look at the names, but I looking at more of a corresponding authors, first author. Whether I look at everybody when I look at it, they Google it, make sure they actually publish something similar, and then actually and they see other similarity. That's what I'm using it mostly. So uh, yeah. So just so everyone knows, the American Journal of Rhinology and Allergy is the first ENT journal that has gone to double-blinded reviews. No, and also so kind of double-blinded. <laughs> kind <Yeah>. of. <laughs> yeah, kind of double finding, but yeah, I agree. Yes. Oh, I see. Got it. Thank you. Oh, hey, Doe. This is Alan. How are you? Good. This is a How very are you? nice talk. Yes. yes. Um, I, I want to touch on the peer review process also. I mean, it seems like I, I, I still remember one of my mentors when I was a residency was if you only get to publish 10 papers in your career, you would have to choose wisely. But now we have kind of moved towards the opposite. Let's publish as much as possible in our career. Right. So what do you think is the responsibility of journals to to make sure that there's research integrity? I mean, I think oftentimes all of us are reviewers. We are just volunteering our time. We don't necessarily look for fraud like you have uh, to look for these these details. What would be the responsibility of a journals to look for this or versus dumping, dumping this on the reviewers. Right. And related to that, as you know, eLife is one of the journals recently that has moved towards that if the papers are sent out for reviews, they don't necessarily have to address the reviewer's comments before it's accepted for publication. Oh, wow. So how would that potentially change the field? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, so that's also a very hard question. So number one was the reviewer. I agree. The journal responsible. I think the journal should respond. I mean, even though, I mean, they're also very busy. I mean, it's like a million dollar business, but they're actually, um, they don't have a lot of reviewers. That's why, like, when I'm working with the several companies, uh, several publishers about the reviewing, associate editors, and they're all complaining about the money, like money. If you add something else, and we need someone to screen, it costs more money. But at the same time, they also did a quality control. Who's going to read those journals? In a few, they're, they're only very nearsighted. They have to look at it for the long term and trying to figure out what can be done. And then also, I, mean, I agree that reviewer cannot, I mean, I agree the human make errors, so sometimes the review is not perfect. What someone find in extra errors, they had to respond very quickly. At the same time, they need to have some kind of system in each journal how to address those issues. And this is, they meet, this is the issues. They have to really respond to it, right? The errors or randoms or there's an author's response or something. They need to have some kind of like resume plan what needs to be done instead of, there's no response. I think that need to have that. At the same time, the, your second question about the, yes, peer review is very important. Uh, but, you know, but the question is the time, I personally feel the time will tell that what the publication and qualifications. Uh, but I also, as a junior, uh, junior attending, a kind of middle, <coughs> middle career attending, I also got a pressure, quality or quantity. So I had to collect more data and submit it like one high impact versus can I submit like multiple small journals as much as possible. But we probably need the both for the residents and also medical students, but at the same time for our fundings and our reputations. So those are kind of also matters. But I also looking at like, 
I didn't talk about authorship, but sometimes if you're not really involved and you're trying to put everybody's names in the journal, <laughs> right? And then there's multiple people. But I would say looking at the, uh, the also like uh, reference, uh, reference number, for example, you have other scores that you actually you know, index, H index or something, that how much people refer your paper. For example, if I do a lot of CF, CF research, but no one actually reads my papers, <laughs> my H index is terrible, which means that it's like, it's not really impactful paper because it's not really popular. It does always mean that the impact of paper is really great, but at the same time, that also could another metrics can consider as those kinds of good research. So I think a time will tell about some of the review process, but I think that everybody agree that now used to be the journals always think that we just publish no matter what, whether or error is not, they're going to figure out later. But now I think the journals now understand that they have a responsibility to make a really good publications. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Do. Uh, One more question. Yeah. Okay, last question. Uh, thank you, Doe, for that talk. Um, uh, very fascinating and very timely because of the rise of like AI text generation, like ChatGPT. Um, I'm curious where you stand ethically on where that line is drawn because, of course, getting ChatGPT to just spit out text and then just submitting that to a journal, that's ethically wrong. But getting ChatGPT to type your first draft and then you put a heavy edit on it or even type your outline or use it to generate your like literature review, right? Like that's something that ChatGPT and all these new AI text generating bots right. are doing, and it's going to only get more sophisticated. Right, right. So where do you stand on sort of policing that? Right. Uh, we, I talk about with my uh, partner Brad about it, and also we talk with. So now he said, "Oh, I'm going to use ChatGPT to write medical <laughs> students' letter recommendation." <laughs> <laughs> I told him, someone is going to find you immediately if you do that. <laughs> so there will be another software will come out. We can check the chat GPT. But I think that there are a lot of the human factors get involved. A human, uh, because uh, if it's more prominent, we probably there may be algorithm we can figure out earlier. At the same time, um, there might be a better uh, search network that we can figure out the pl plagiarism very quickly. The finding of plagiar uh, plagiarism is very difficult right now. I just Grammarly, but like there's some other website using it. A lot of journals are using it. Uh, but finding of plagiarism probably the another thing. Uh, but yeah, I thought about adding that at the last uh, slide, but I didn't. The chat GP, that's on the new hot topic. But I think it's going to change a lot of our. I, I once I thought that oh they could write my grant also. <laughs> 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 Right. Might. Yeah. right. So like oh they can write everything for me. But uh, but I think there will be. Now, to the point that there's like, there will be way, if someone already did that, like, you know, but um, there will be a lot of plagiarism to raise it. I think there will be another, I assume there will be another AI website that can detect that, which was done by the, that, that, yeah. That's very, but it's, it's upcoming. It just started it, so we don't know what's going to happen in the next few years or so. Yeah. There is already a website. It? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. It's kind of open AI announced that they will create another AI to track yes. whether it was written by GPU. Exactly. And the cycle is complete. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's kind of, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Great. Great. Well, Great talk, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay.